Okay, so the first session is really going to talk today about 1880s to the Korean War. And the second session is the Korean War to the present. And it's about how Korean Americans shape history. Um, and what I'm hoping we can do is really reframe our idea of, of what history is and how we participate in it. Okay, and just for the ease of this discussion, what I did was I broke up this talk into about three different um, sections, okay? The very early point, which includes up to 1910, the immigration and annexation by Japan of Korea. Um, 10 to 49 would obviously encompass both world wars. I mean, this is really just a, a quick breeze through a lot of period of time and then through 49, which is right prior to the Korean War, and then the Korean War, okay? And if you have a pencil and paper or a pen or something you wanna take notes, I think it might be nice because I'm gonna be doing um, a little exercise with you afterwards, okay? And, you know, not to make it all homework, but just something to bear in mind. Okay, one of the things that I want us really to figure out is this, um, idea of how do we know what we know. Um, the epistemological idea of how do we come to understand ourselves as a group, which then affects the telling of our history. There are always two ways that we learn stories. We learn stories implicitly and explicitly. An implicit story is something that we simply um, come to understand because there's demonstrations and examples of this and we do not question the origin around it. It is not a story that is specifically told to us, like sit down, I'm gonna tell you a story, okay? The other type of story that we come to understand is like an explicit story, which to some degree I'm doing now today, which is me saying, this is a story, um, pay attention and I'm gonna tell you this kind of story. How we come to understand history is always through text. When I say the word text, however, I'm using a broad definition of the word text. We think of text now, especially, especially in the field of cultural studies, as something like a film could be a text, a series of photographs, journalism. It doesn't have to be, you know, a scroll or something, you know, like a book when I'm talking about text. But I want us to think about this idea of how things are recorded and how things are remembered, because this will shape your perspective on Korean American history, of which you are a part. Okay, so what does it mean to be a Korean American and really think about this idea of collective and personal? Now, to put us all in context as a group, the vast majority of you probably have not taken any Korean American history. It's not really offered as a major at many universities. It simply isn't taught at school. Um, there might be some mention of the um, certain ideas of Chinese American history or even Japanese American history, but we do really do not see much Korean American history at all. So just to put us in context of where I'm gonna kick it off in 1882, I want you to take a, a little bit of a look at this. Um, of special note would be the, the Treaty of Kanghua, which is the Japan-Korea relationship, okay? And um, because the first immigrants were going towards Hawaii, um, the idea of contract laborers coming in, okay? So think about this in terms of the time. Okay, so here we go. Really the very first um, demonstration or relationship opened with the Shufelt Treaty, okay? So Kojong, the king, he was very pro-United States. And the reason was, was he figured the US, one of the reasons, major reason, is too far away to really be of threat. This was an attempt to kind of open up what is known as the hermit kingdom to outside influence, okay, beyond the borders. And as you know, Korea has also always been a point of um, uh, a, a 
a state that was under control or governance, either with as a vassal state in some ways of China or of Japan later, really as the, in the late 19th and early 20th century. Okay, so this treaty, interestingly enough, was not written in Korean and English. It was actually executed in English and Chinese. And I think that says quite a bit about where Korea was at the time and what was maybe to be expected. But there was a, a, a great faith in what this promised, okay? Now, at the same time, what was unfolding was the Chinese Exclusion Act, which was not really repealed until 1943. As you know, the Chinese immigrant, the Chinese migrant labor were already coming into the United States. There was the gold rush in California. There was um, the railroad building in the 1860s and 70s. So there were quite a few Chinese who were already in the United States and they were perceived as a threat to white labor, okay? Um, they were engaging in a lot of professions like most migrants. Um, that people didn't want to do. They were um, cooks and construction workers and laundry people and providing the hard manual labor. And they were actually um, remitting many millions of dollars, one of the largest con contributors to the tax dollars of the various areas in which they lived, okay? So there was, however, a great fear of them. And this was born obviously out of discrimination and so began the Chinese Exclusion Act, which was really the very first US Immigration Act that targeted a specific ethnicity and racial category, okay? And obviously, if you're Asian American, this would have reverberated and affected how you were perceived within the United States. The very first immigrants came from 1903 to five, okay? This is when immigration opened. Um, it was driven by many things. There were famines. There was a lot of political unrest in Korea at the time. There was a growing interest in um, Confucian, uh, not Confucianism, in Christianity. Actually, one of the advisors to Ko Jong, what the king was a um, Christian. And um, so there was a lot of discussion about what this possibly meant. If you were the type who immigrated, you really were abandoning a lot of ideas that were central and core to a Korean identity. Because as you know, with Confucianism, you're supposed to be attending to the graves of your ancestors, i.e. your parents, the closest ancestors. So somebody who immigrated has already decided that they will not be doing this. So the people who immigrated were those who um, had broken in, in a sense with many of the ideas that maybe would have kept them within a different sense of collective belonging. Okay, and this is very important for us. I want you to think about this idea of how change comes about and what prompts movement. Okay, so at the time, you know, you can say many of them were Christian, but you also have to remember during that time period to prepare to immigrate, all the men were wearing top knots. You would have cut your hair you would have started to potentially think, or maybe not right there after you got on the boat or right before you got on the boat, you would have uh, attempted to grow a mustache to fit in in the West. Um, when you were in church in Korea at the time, there was a sheet that was dividing men from women. So gender was very separated in Korea at the time of the early 20th century. So you can imagine they underwent three different physicals, um, they, you know, they were promised um, good wages and that their children would be able to get an education. Um, many were thinking differently and um, there was a lot of trauma. And so they boarded the, boarded the ship. And upon going into the ship, you can imagine the shock because obviously they're going to be sharing quarters with people who are strange men and women, you know, the whole, and on each ship, there was a minister, a Christian minister who 
attended. So by the time people docked in Hawaii, or let's say if they went on to California, they would have, the majority of them would have converted to Christianity. So while many Koreans are Christian, you need to think about the, the length of time this, uh, this faith has been a part of our culture, and it really hasn't been that way for very long. Um, the first missions were uh, the Methodist Episcopal mission. This is what the Koreans were associated with. It should be noted that what happened, you know, you wonder why, am, why is my family a Methodist or why are they Presbyterian? Well, what happened was the white missionaries got together and basically divvied it up. They said, okay, the Hawaiians and Chinese, we're gonna make them Congregationalists. You, you take the Japanese Korean, they gotta be Methodist, <laughs> Episcopal or Presbyterian. So it wasn't as if the Asian population was choosing these specific sects to belong to. They were simply divvied up, okay? Um, there, the initial party, um, you know, was noted in the paper, but unlike all the other immigrants, if you were an immigrant or if you were a person that came to Hawaii on a ship and you were Western or European, they would list your name in the paper. Koreans, of course, you were not, you were, probably in the hold, you were not considered worthy of how you were going to be the migrant labor. So you weren't considered worthy of being listed in that sense. Um, and they then were part of this mission group. They went, they stepped off the, um, they stepped off the ship and they were sh shipped off to the various plantations, primarily sugar and um, pineapple. Okay. And uh, Right at that time in 1905, what also happened was um, immigration was stopped, okay? Because there were in 1905, um, a group of Koreans who went on to Mexico and word got back to Korea that they were basically kept as slaves, okay? So the emperor stopped it. So the initial group of around 7,000 people they were there, they were urban, they were revolutionaries, they were fighting against a lot of Japanese colonialism. This is also what prompted them. They were fairly literate and um, they were a people that were divided by the fact that Japan had ruled their nation. So unlike, let's say, Japanese or Chinese immigrants of the time, their country was really in turmoil. The, while the initial boat and the initial numbers, let's say about a thousand went on from Hawaii to California and a thousand went back to Korea, most chose to stay, unlike many others who were back and forth. There were fewer numbers, but there, there was a feeling they didn't have a nation to return to. There were people that were potentially, let's say, wanted by the J Japan's imperial forces or whatever. So. Um, Koreans, when they left, they really, they really left, okay? And as you can see, this is, on the left is a little bit of a welcome for the new people that were coming off the boat, okay? Plantation life, okay? In 1905 already, they were agitating for the U.S. government about Japan. Um, Korean Americans were very devoted revolutionaries. They already started to strike. There was a Luna who was a plantation person who had abused a Korean worker. Immediately, 80 to 120 of the Korean workers started to strike in support of their fellow worker. They were, Koreans were also known as strike breakers, right? With the Japanese and the Filipino and the Chinese laborers, they were called in. And there wasn't a sense of an Asian American identity, which we're still doing now. We're still undergoing this idea, right? They were still very much divided, but the plantation started to shift that. You know, people will call by numbers. They weren't even known by their names. On the top left, there's a thing called the bongo. You wore a tag, okay? You, you agreed to work 10 hours a day. There was somebody standing there with a whip in the heat. Um, it was six days a week. You got Sunday off, right? You couldn't go really go back. Most of you were indebted if you were there. You couldn't easily go back. So um, plantation life was hard. And in fact, this is how hard it was. Early in the 20th century, there was actually a group of African-Americans who came from the South to Hawaii to work on the plantations and they left, 
because the vast majority of them left because they said it was worse. Okay, so this gives you a little bit idea of what the conditions were like. Um, in 1905, so Korean, uh, history, Korean American history has always been influenced, obviously, by Korea. But there was an agreement, the Taft Katsura Agreement, which was US was extending its colonial powers, taking over the Philippines, cut a deal in a sense with Japan saying, we won't bother you about Korea if you don't bother us about the Philippines. I'm really making a shorthanded discussion here about it, but it was kind of this silent agreement. And this was a very disturbing, obviously, to the Koreans who had looked because the 1882, um, you know, the Chemopo agreement, they had looked to America as somebody that would possibly save their situation. Um, this is an example of, um, there was an assassination attempt then on, um, Stevens, who was then in, he was part of the American um, legation in Tokyo. He then jumped to be a part of the Japanese government and was sort of known as an American dictator on behalf of Japan. Um, Korean American revolutionaries who were in California, um, Zhang and Jun, um, there was sort of a, there was an outbreak, Zhang shot, um, he was killed. And this was kind of an example of how, when we think about Korean American history, there's always a spillover in a sense to what is going on in Korea. We cannot easily separate the two. Koreans remain extremely involved in what is going on in their homeland always. And this is really a prime example of this. 1910, to um, 1945 was a period of Japanese colonialism in Korea. In 1904 to five, there was the Japan-Russo War. Um, Japan defeated Russia, it was the first time that a Asian power defeated a Western power. This really sent a ripple throughout the globe. Um, and in doing so, they asserted their colonial domination of Korea. There's an excellent book by Richard Kim I'd like to recommend about this period of time. Um, during this period of time of Japanese colonialism, which some of you would have your grandparents or parents uh, familiar with this, um, they attempted to er completely eradicate Korean identity. It's very similar in a sense to what the mainland government is doing now in the Northwest region of China. Um, all the schools in Korea were supposed to change and the children had to be instructed in the Japanese language. Everyone changed their name and had to be instructed in um, and had to take on a Japanese name, not only a first name, but a last name, which is what the title story is about. Um, the, if you learned or spoke Korean, it had to be in the privacy of your home, but it was something that was secret. For example, you know, my father said that he remembered his older brother secretly learning how to read and write Korean, but my grandfather not teaching him or his younger siblings and this being a secret, him, him looking as his older brother is learning this. So there was an attempt to obliterate completely a Korean identity. And why I want you to think about this is how this would reverberate within the context of Korean America and what this would mean. If you were somebody who was an immigrant here, who had ideas maybe of return, you would not be um, looking necessarily to return, knowing and understanding what is going on at this stage in your the country of your cultural origin, okay? Now, in 1917, there was um, the Asiatic Bard Zone Act, which a series of immigration acts came up from 1917 through the 20s, 1920s. And this continued, and we'll discuss this throughout the 20th century. But suffice to say, American immigration and American policy has always had a very problematic relationship to Asia, okay? 
Um, and yet the Korean American community did continue to thrive. There was an influx of Korean American women and they were known as picture brides. And yes, they did uh, swap out their pictures often with a much older man from who had been toiling away on the plantation or as a laborer in the, in the continental US. Um, and he would send a picture of himself as quite an older man, a uh, younger man. And he, the young woman uh, who the marriage had been arranged would step off the boat and find herself married to, you know, getting ready to be married to somebody who might be at least 20 years older than her. Um, this is not quite the example, because you can see there's not necessarily the age gap all the time. But what I find is interesting is if you look at the left, you can see this slow transformation of a Korean American identity. See, she is wearing like a hanbok, right? But you know, it is white and there's this idea of an American bride also at the same time. So this is where we see how the identity formation is really beginning because it's taking root in ideas of family, okay? I included this because um, it's probably not a well-known fact and we'd have to dig around more, but there were Korean Americans who were participating as early as World War I. I took this picture in the nearby cemetery. And what I love about seeing cemeteries here is we can really see how long Korean Americans have been participating in all aspects of American life. Okay, so World War I was 1914 to 18. Obviously, this person, a young Pai Kim, died in 1945, but you know, he was a participant, obviously, in World War I. Um, and this is from the Schofield Barracks, this middle picture. Um, this is after World War I, but there's still, there was a, a non-white unit of um, combat soldiers and military. Imp very importantly was a young man or a man called Pak Young Man, and he was considered a Korean revolutionary. At the time, many Koreans were giving a, the equivalent of a dollar of a day of their wages, which was a lot of money, um, to the revolutionary cause to overthrow the Japanese empire. And this man, Pak Young Man, um, he gathered up a lot of the men who were working and with an idea that um, he did not believe that Korea could be freed from Japanese colonialism without, a mili without military action. So he was forming basically a Korean military here in Hawaii, which was then not part of the United States, but it uh, shows you something about how people are constructing idea of nation at this very early stage. So nation building, right, was happening in Hawaii, which was not even a part of the United States, in an attempt to move this military then back to Korea. There's another thing that was going on too, and this on the far right is Sigmund Rhee. Um, and he was also part of an idea of nation building. He was, um, a student at Princeton. He was a Korean dissident for many years and he was a Christian missionary here in Hawaii. And his idea was supposedly, was that Korea could be won and freed from Japan under ideas of diplomacy. Again, I am speaking in very broad terms and as we'll look at later, Sigmund Rhee, um, you know, pivoted in many directions that would not suggest that he was diplomatic, but this is, in the early days. There is also the formation of the Korean National Association, which then morphed into, in, in effect, a Korean provisional government. And this provisional government moved. It was in California, it was here in Hawaii, it was in, in Shanghai briefly. There was, so in other words, this idea of a government formation was happening and very much a part of the Korean American identity. It was very deeply vested in the idea of being free from colonial Japan. And there were schools, okay? So this is an example of a plantation school, the children. Um, so if you uh, were a field worker, a woman or man, you would send your child to this uh, boarding school. There was a day school and also boarding school so that your child could get an education in Bible study, Chinese, 
English, and I think the girls did sewing, a few things like this. Um, also emerging at the time was the dawn of the Korean American woman, okay? Um, and as you can see, this very much replicated a Western or American idea of a woman's identity. You know, they're very confident. They're looking at the camera. Um, there's an engagement with the profession here of nursing. Um, I know that nursing was, for example, considered, it was quite scandalous if you were a Korean or Korean American woman to become a nurse, because at the time it was considered very inappropriate to be around potentially men's naked bodies and to be around um, people you didn't know in that sense. So even going out and doing something like being a nurse was a great break of tradition. And you can see this one Korean American woman, there she is wearing these, um, Kind of Hawaiian hula outfit and then symbolically standing in front of the plane. So, so what we're seeing again is a different kind of idea of history of, of what, how do we participate in the collective narrative, right, of Korean America. And this was spurred um, by the spontaneous March 1st, 1919 movement it was spurred, you know, that, that behavior that I showed you was part of what was going on, right? 1920, women got the right to vote. It was a sort of a global like discussion of this, but also in 1919, there was a spontaneous movement. This was upon the death of the King in Korea. Uh, Koreans gathered to protest Japanese um, colonialism and there were parades everywhere. There was a huge one in Hawaii and it was put on here by the Korean Women's Relief Society and people marched. And there was, uh, afterwards, there is a Korean girl named Ru Gwang Yu and she was known, she became known in Korea and came to symbolize ideas of um, rebellion um, um, and uh, na national identity. Okay, so in other words, what I wanna stress is that a Korean American identity is deeply linked to a Korean identity free of colonial input. I like to show this because, um, you know, I know that Korean Americans always talk about being a 1.5 generation and these were the other 1.5 generation Korean Americans. And so these were Korean Americans whose families came in 1903 to five, maybe they were born here or they were born and came over when they were children and um, they were the other 1.5 generation. And this group on the right, for example, this is the very first group of Korean American students who went back to Korea. So in 1923, Sigmund Rhee uh, decided that he was gonna show off how modern Korean Americans can be. And he brought back a group from Hawaii's um, plantation families of their children. And the boys played on a demo baseball team and had some games in Korea. And the girls and, and the girls, I think they did volleyball. And the girls and boys also played, in, you know, there was a joint symphony and orchestra kind of event. And so wherever they went, you know, they said, the, the Koreans would follow them because they were speaking English. This must have looked so strange. And they would try to pinch them and follow them in Korea. And, um, but this was the first kind of Korean American uh, homeland sojourn to take place. And um, so I thought it was great for you all to see. Um, one of the things I also want us to think about is um, this idea of a collective history and how we think about history. Quite often when we're thinking about history, we think about the famous people who are powerful, the presidents and the famous generals and um, you know, the powerful um, ambassadors, but history is made by the ordinary person. History is made by the dry cleaner. It is made by the person who is a tailor. It is made by the waiter and the farmer. And it is made by people like yourselves and your families, no matter who or what they did, okay? This is what makes the Korean American history. It is not necessarily 
a history of the actions of a few powerful people. It is how the collective body has responded and moved and exerted pressure upon various institutions. So these are the people who make Korean American history, just like you are somebody who makes Korean American history. You graduate like on the left from high school, right? You're, you learn in a school situation. Your grandparents gather and they went to picnics. Um, your mother was a secretary. Your dad was a cook. These are all things that are part of our history collectively. These are things we do not read about because we're not recorded in this, but this is the question that I'm asking you. What do you think also matters about Korean American history, knowing that a Korean American history is made by people like yourself? Now, um, Korean Americans in World War II, as you know, and I'm, this is one of the things that is studied in schools, although more recently, um, there was the Japanese internment order. Um, so Japanese Americans were sent into camps during World War II. Um, and they're the two of the most, the most decorated units from World War II um, was the 100th and the 442, okay? And this suffered the highest number of casualties. And to date, it is the most decorated unit. And it was primarily made of Nisei or second generation Japanese American soldiers. Um, their insignia, they were known as the go for broke um, uh, unit. And they were led by here, uh, Colonel Kim, who we here at the Council of Korean Americans put up for the presidential uh, model. And it's a very, um, I think it's a deeply symbolic uh, figure that you need to think about because this was really the making of a Korean American identity. Historically, Japan and Korea have always been and always were at odds, even during World War II, obviously. And Korea dramatically suffered under Japanese colonialism. Yet it was this Korean American who led Japanese American soldiers to victory. And it was this kind of shedding of a singular past identity from Asia, okay? And, um, Within the context of Korean Americans, many Korean Americans were wearing buttons that declared they were not Japanese. They were not interned, but they knew them and they were often categorized together. So the interesting thing is because of the numbers of Koreans, for example, even in the 1910s to 30s here in Hawaii, Japanese and Koreans were often put together in the schools. They had the Susanna Wesley home for Japanese and Korean American children to study. They were, in other words, categorized and moved together. There was a, a forced Asian American identity, even no matter what was happening in their home country, okay? So again, this is about how Korean American identity and history is also deeply linked to an Asian American identity and history. It's very difficult for us to parse the threads because we are often thrown together. Um, no, no boy, I'm some, sure some of you know, this was the question 26 and 27 and they asked Japanese American men if they would swear, alle swear allegiance to the United States, reject their um, historical ties to Japan and be willing to to die basically and go to war for the United States. And if they checked off no, no, they were sent to a different camp and um, there was fears of statelessness, et cetera. And while in the past we viewed um, even within the Japanese um, American community, these uh, men who did this were viewed often in a negative light and were rejected. Now time has shown us that this was an important expression of what it means to be loyal and what it means for us to question what our government does here in the United States. So they've been, I would say, um, historically viewed differently, very, very differently than they were at the time. 1945, 
I'm sure you know this from American history. This is Potsdam, World War II was decided. Um, and basically what happened was Korea was then divided up, okay? Th this is the dawn of the Cold War. This is the last time the West met with Russia. You know, the US met with Russia and it was a kind of an agreement to divide Korea up and who orchestrated this was Truman and Stalin, okay? Um, at Right during that time, the bomb was dropped on Japan. The nuclear bomb was dropped on Japan. Stalin knew it was going to happen, but you know, you know, it, it's it it was during this conference, and they agreed to divide roughly at the thirtieth parallel. Okay, um, this would have far-reaching implications. They had to do something because Japan had to withdraw and go back to Japan, right? But then they're like, "What? It's all up for grabs." So, in other words, if you look at Korea and how it was throughout the 20th century. It was always viewed as a place where larger powers extended their might and made decisions, okay? And this was really came to embody this. Um, 1946, okay, so we're looking at different ideas of citizenship that are starting to emerge. Also Chinese citizenship became possible after World War II. And here's on a, a little bit of a lighter note, oops. Um, uh, the first gold medalist, um, Asian American were Vicky Manalo Draves, who was a Filipina American. And she won two days, a day and a half, I think, before uh, Dr. Sammy Lee, both of them for diving. Um, they were great friends. And again, it's an, an example of Asian Americans together, but of course he's, he is the very first Korean American gold medalist. 1948, um, it's divided up. We have Sigmund Rhee who spent 30 years of his life in the United States. I want you to think about this. Like that, the, the, all that time, what does that mean to how he thinks, what he's acting like? His wife, was not Korean American. His wife was Austrian. He was actually an Asian head of state with a white wife, okay? Um, and the North Korean appointed was uh, Kim Il-sung, okay? Um, this was a time of deep unrest. People were not happy about this. Many Koreans rose up um, and protested. Um, there was a feeling that larger powers were exerting their might on this nation and that feeling was correct, okay? And it was a time of mass executions and imprisonment, both in North and South Korea. So for despite the fact that Sivian Re was considered a democratic representative, um, that's a very subjective analysis of who and what he was. Okay, and this led then to the Korean War. This war significant on many levels. First of all, I wanted to reframe this as the remembered war, um, rather than what U.S. News World and Report, you know, uh, de declared it the Forgotten War, and that name stuck. And part of the reason was was Truman was really afraid of another world war. So there was this idea that this is a police action. This isn't really a war, although you know, around 5 million people died from this war. So it's, it's um, you know, it's, it was a war without, people wanted to admit it was a war and it was a cold war. This was the beginning of the ideas of proxy wars, which is what we continue to engage in in the United States and, and globally. We let other people fight the wars about different things and we funnel the money into various governments to do so. This is also the first war that had the UN involved. So when the soldiers came back in the United States, they had the UN flag often draped over them. Um, it was not just the United States that was involved, but the UN was called into question, okay? So on June 25th, what happened was there was an invasion from the North to the South. This was not expected. They, di they didn't have very many troops left in Korea. Some of them were in Japan. They were told to move over to Korea. It was, they were warned that this might possibly happen, but people ignored it. And MacArthur then, who was part of World War II, stepped into this situation and this caused a really hugely difficult 
and long drawn out battle unnecessarily. So as you can see from the map of the left, um, at one point, so the, nor the North quickly took over um, uh, South Korea in, this, in the space of Seoul within a matter of, of days and months and drove the Southern faction down into Busan. Just refugees were everywhere, back and forth. It was, it was a nightmare in a matter of months. And then there was the Incheon landing. And then again, there was a huge push North and, and Truman, what he wanted to do not Truman, MacArthur, what he basically was wanting to do was to continue this war all the way up to Manchuria. Then it came back down again, and then it finally settled on the 38th. So for two years, they were basically fighting in the same position after this up, down, up, down situation. And um, it, it concluded, but there was never sort of a formal peace treaty, okay? Um, and so technically the two sides are, still at war, okay? This is important for us to know now. It explains a lot of what's going on currently. There were also things that came up during the Korean War that were new in terms of war, not just simply the, the UN, but this idea of civilian casualties and war crimes, okay? One of the most famous is the Nogunri massacre, which broke news in 1999 through AP investigation. Um, the U.S. government still doesn't fully acknowledge the extents of this war crime, and what has also been uncovered that still hasn't been fully brought out is the extent to which Americans um, fired upon the civilian population. They were told, you know, there's refugees, you know, the one order was fire upon the people wearing white. Everybody in Korea was wearing white, right? So, so you can imagine what this did. And uh, during this uh, massacre, um, most of the people were huddled under the bridge using for four days um, bodies as sort of bags to protect them. And um, it all came out, you know, we're talking decades later, there was an investigation and it's still ongoing, but they um, proportion to the population, there were more civilians killed in the Korean war than almost any war to date. MacArthur, who was gunning for a third world war, clearly was fired by Truman, who did not want to have this kind of action. And um, the Korean War shortly afterwards, within two years was battling, but it came to an end, okay? 1952 was when Koreans could immigrate and become citizens. Another thing that happened that maybe can also speak to, if we think about what resonates today, is the Korean War was the first war where blacks and whites were supposed to be integrated in American troops. Now, did this happen? Not really. What happened was 48, Truman signed the thing saying everyone should be integrated and it didn't really happen. Black troops were really under um, underprepared, blamed, MacArthur was a racist. Uh, the black troops were the ones that were also sent up to the um, the Chosun Res the the Reservoir War with Manchuria, uh, the the huge battle in Manchuria. They were abused. Um, they were treated very poorly to the extent that Thurgood Marshall, then an attorney with the NAACP, was sent in to investigate this. Okay. Um, what happened was in World War II, the troops were not were still segregated, and they got a lot of leftover kind of generals, et cetera, or colonels, captains, who were running the troops in um, Korea, who then didn't really um, attempt to integrate at all. Okay, but this was the beginning of it. Okay, so it was in the Korean War. And these were some of the casualties and numbers. And the numbers are very inconsistent. I have to say, after looking at all of them, you know, there's not a clear count because there can't be a clear count because of North Korea. Um, the Chinese, also mainland China, the, the, the count is, is not um, clear either. Um, but this is roughly what it is expected to be and looked at as. Thank you.